I'm Nick Pettit. I'm Jason Seifer. And you're watching The Treehouse Show, your weekly dose of internets where we talk about all things web design, web development, and more. In this episode, we'll be talking about triangles, sublime text plugins, and HTML5 geolocation. Let's check it out. First up, we're going to talk about using the HTML5 Geolocation API. The HTML5 Geolocation API is built into different web browsers and it gives you access to the user's location if they give you permission. So there's a great blog post over on the SitePoint blog that goes through all of the different things that you're going to need to know when trying to access user's location with the Geolocation API. So they go through a few different scenarios where you can use the Geolocation API. Uh, something like movie theater sites can promote films playing nearby, uh, job postings including potential commute times, and just uh, a few different use cases for that. So they also go through and tell you the different APIs that you can use, you know, latitude, longitude, accuracy, and timestamp. So we're not going to really go through everything in this article, but if you want to know more about how it works, it's a great in-depth tutorial to get you up to speed on using the geolocation API. Pretty nifty. So you know that moment in a project where you're you're really getting going, you're using HTML5 boilerplate or bootstrap, yeah. and you're like, yeah, this yeah. is gonna be awesome. This is gonna and be then, awesome. And then you have to make a a, a triangle in CSS and you're wah, like, wah. like, oh my gosh. OMG. I, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> what do you do? Well, fortunately, there's the CSS triangle generator that has solved this exact problem. You can go ahead and Check out the CSS triangle generator, and if you need a triangle that points upwards to the right, bottom right, bottom left, you get the idea. It will go ahead and generate the CSS for you over here. And you can even pick the, the color of the triangle, and it will adjust that. You can adjust the size, and if you need to support Internet Explorer, there's a little checkbox for it. Look at that. Boom. Wish Done. it was always that easy. And you can even say if you want this triangle to be isosceles or scaling. Scaling? Am I, am I saying that right? I have no idea. This is literally the first day I've ever heard of triangles. Boom. And yeah, it'll go ahead and generate the CSS for you. And it even gives you a few little browser compatibility tips. So pretty nifty. If you need to make a triangle in CSS to go ahead and point to something in your application, for instance, or maybe you're making a comment box and you want a little triangle to look like a, a speech bubble in a comic book or something, this would be great for that kind of thing. So pretty nifty. Very nice. Uh, next up, we got a tool called Framer. This is a prototyping tool that helps you build and test interactions for your website. Now, this doesn't use um, uh, what do you call this? Doesn't use Flash or Quartz or anything like that. It's a good alternative to uh, Quartz Composer and Keynote. So what you're going to use this for is going through and just seeing how the interactions work on a phone, you know, or a mobile device. So they have an example here on the right side. There's a little uh, Alcatraz Island here with a pop-up. Click on that and it zooms out. So you can just kind of test and see how these different interactions work on the site. This is built for designers, and it's very, very easy to go through, edit the code, and see how things are actually going to look live. So you can get that at framerjs.com. And there's a, a ton of different examples on the site, and like I said, very, very easy to use. You're basically just editing a couple of files to try and produce these interactions and see what they're going to look like. That's, that's really, really cool. I mean, it, it's good to have a tool where you can quickly prototype user experience because a lot of time it's not just drawing out wireframes and figuring out the flow from one screen to the next. You actually want to see what the, the interactions and clicks feel like. Yeah. Uh, so it's nice to be able to prototype it quickly without actually building this, this huge application and then realizing, oh, crap, this actually doesn't work at all. Right. So, then you need to go back and retool it. Just give it a try first. Yep. Pretty nifty. So next up are the top 10 Sublime Text plugins. This is a really nice blog post. I won't go through all 10 of the plugins, but there is one that I thought was particularly nifty here. It's for JSLint, which is a JavaScript code quality tool put together 
by Douglas Crockford, a JavaScript expert. And before this, you would have to actually go and verify your code on the web. You'd basically, you know, uh, paste your JavaScript code and figure out if it was good or not. With this, it's actually just directly in Sublime Text too. So if you're a JavaScript developer, this is definitely a plugin that you'll want to use in ST2. There's, of course, nine other really cool plugins, and you know, we don't want to spoil it, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I don't want don't want to give everything away here, but uh, you know, if you're in Sublime Text 2 all day. Uh, this is, it, it, it's really important to go ahead and customize it to your workflow because it's just going to make you that much faster. Very nice. Uh, next up, we have a project called RubyJS. Now, this is an alpha project, but it's still pretty usable. And this is a JavaScript standard library based on the Ruby core lib. Uh, what does that mean? Well, this gives you access to uh, a bunch of functions that you are probably used to in Ruby, and you can use them right in JavaScript. The example that they have on the site is written in CoffeeScript, but it would work in JavaScript as well. And it introduces, you know, almost all of the API that you would expect. You get strings, arrays, uh, enumerators, which is very, very helpful. Now, uh, one of the places that this would be a lot more useful is if, you know, you're going through and you're trying not to context switch too much in between languages that you're developing. So without mentally switching from, you know, Ruby to JavaScript, you don't have to go and look up some documentation for methods that you're probably used to using. Uh, and you can check that out at rubyjs.com. Pretty nifty. So. There's this really cool article on CSS tricks, and of course, Chris Coyer that runs CSS tricks is a friend of Treehouse. And the article is called, So You're Going to Start a Huge New Web Project. This is something that I think about a lot, you know, and it's actually a question I, I receive a lot. How do I start a new project? What's the best way to, you know, account for mobile? Which CSS framework should I use? Etc. And Chris encountered this question when he was doing a consulting gig for a huge new website, and so he wanted to share what he shared with uh, a company. And he said, "You cannot neglect mobile," which I think is pretty obvious. Another thing that he said you should decide up front is if you're going to build a mobile-specific site or if you're going to use responsive design or some variation thereof. Um, I thought that was a pretty good tip. Your content management system needs to be in good shape. Of course, that's important if you want to go ahead and do this work and then pass it off to the client so that they can go ahead and update the site on their own without having to bug you. Um, this is actually, uh, this is the last tip I'll, I'll go over, but this is something that Chris has talked about um, at a couple of conferences. He says you need to plan your CSS. So in other words, you can't just run in and haphazardly start coding your CSS because it's going to grow organically and it'll probably end up as a mess. CSS is one of those things that's really, really easy to get started with, but it takes a long time to really master all of its nuances and use it responsibly. So by coming up with a plan up front, you'll make sure that you avoid a mess of CSS. Look, it rhymes. That's how you know it has to be right. Avoid a mess of CSS. Boom. Boom. It's a quick tip. I usually start planning a website with about 10 hours of meditation, mm. followed by 20 hours of exercise. And then five minutes of actual work. Yeah, then, then you're done. You know, your site's good to go. Simple. Uh, next up, we have a post over on the HTML5 Rocks blog on the Shadow DOM. Now, this is something that is not fully standardized, uh, and it says the API is still in flux. But this is really, really interesting. So they're talking about web components here. Now, this is a new standard that essentially is for presenting different kinds of widgets on your site. Now, the problem that you would get is, you know, if you have a script that's injecting uh, some HTML and JavaScript and CSS into a page, well, some of your IDs and CSS selectors might conflict with something on the page, and that could just mess up a whole bunch of stuff. So the solution to this is something called the Shadow DOM, which is kind of like 
a DOM within a DOM. It's kind of like a, a CSS inception. It's, it's just DOMs all the way down. Yeah, DOMs all the way down. So this tutorial over on HTML5 Rocks goes through, discusses what the shadow DOM is, how you're going to be able to use it in your pages, and what it's going to look like. This is a, a really long article, uh, but it's really interesting. So go through it, and this is generally right now only available on the latest versions of Chrome, but it's something that's probably going to be used quite a bit in the future with you know, all these websites interacting differently. No, that, that's actually a really good piece of advice. Uh, a lot of times I'll find that as soon as something gets implemented in Chrome or a WebKit browser, usually it's a pretty strong indicator that other browsers are going to, to follow suit. Yeah. So good to pay attention to that. Next up is overappy.com or overapi.com. And it's basically just a collection of cheat sheets for different languages and frameworks like PHP, jQuery, Python, JavaScript, and so on. So I can go ahead and click on one of these. So I'll click on Ruby. This is just for you, Jason. Oh, thanks, Nick. And it will come up with this cheat sheet wow, where look I can at that look cheat at sheet. all of the arrays and files and strings and things. Basically, all the functions in uh, in Ruby. So I can go ahead and click on one of these. And look at that. It brings me straight to the documentation for that particular thing. That's really useful. So pretty nifty. It's a, it's a good way to just quickly get to any piece of documentation. I really like how their cheat sheets are, are laid out. And so, there's a ton of them. Yeah, they, they actually have quite a bit of them here. Um, so it is pretty comprehensive, uh, really, really good. You're unlikely to not find something here. It, did I get the double negatives right there? I'm I think completely I positive. Cross. They have a lot of stuff. Nice. It's good. You should check it out. <laughs> yeah, that's probably a good point to wrap up. Yep. Uh, who are you on Twitter? I'm at Nick RP. And I am at Jay Cipher. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of The Treehouse Show. For show notes and more, check out our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash go treehouse. And of course, if you'd like to see more videos like this one about web design, web development, mobile, business, and more, be sure to check us out at teamtreehouse.com. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next week. If you'd like to see more advanced videos and tutorials like this one, go to teamtreehouse.com and start learning for free.